Awaken the Tomb Worlds and reanimate your best warriors? Let's talk about how the Necrons will be marching to war in 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Necrons, and in this video I thought we'd do an overview of their 10th edition rules, a full review of their index, their forge world, and their points costs. Necrons definitely look like they've had some very interesting changes going into the new edition. People seem to be ranking them as one of the stronger armies in the game right now. Some really strong units, and particularly some massive synergistic reanimation tricks, so it looks like it's maybe not the worst time in the world to be a deathless, soulless, undead robot. In Index Necrons for 40k 10th edition, it's set up much like the other indexes. Reanimation protocols reinterpreted as the new faction rule. All your units gradually heal themselves back towards full health. Maybe not enormously strong in itself, but there's multiple ways that you can make it far, far more powerful on the datasheets and stratagems. The Awakened Dynasty is the Necron launch detachment, giving you command protocols as its dynastic special rule. Basically, leaders work a little bit better and make your warriors shoot straighter. There's then six stratagems, which I think are generally quite powerful and tend to be more so for any units with leaders, and four enhancements, which are among the stronger ones in Warhammer 40k, in my opinion. Particularly with so many strong leaders running around, I feel like quite a few of them will tend to turn up in competitive Necron lists. In the core index, there's around about 50 data sheets, pretty similar compared with the 9th edition rules. And now we've also got the Forge World options from Imperial Armor as well. I'll also cover these here as well, alongside their points from the Munitorum Field Manual to put everything in context and how good it's looking at the moment. Let's jump straight into it then, and the army rule is reanimation protocols. This is the one that you'll get regardless of your detachment. Necrons have got their codex coming in winter, so not too long to wait compared with certain other codexes out there, and that should give a few more options for ways to play the faction. The way that reanimation protocols works these days is that basically in each of your command phase, you regenerate D3 wounds. It happens at the end of your command phase, so after things like battle shock, and those wounds are restored to the unit sequentially. So say if you had this unit of three Necron Locust Destroyers, where there was one dead, one injured, if you rolled a three on your D3, you'd first restore the one to the injured one, then you'd resurrect the next one back on one wound, then we'd restore one wound to that injured model. I think the rule's really quite a nice one now, to be honest. It's a lot more even between the different models and the army. You're reanimating a similar amount of value, whether it's on hordes or more elite units or three wound models. Three and four wound models in particular got very little value out of the last rule. This one also replaces living metal as well, so your vehicles get to regenerate D3 wounds rather than just one these days, so that's quite a nice boost for them. Overall, I do quite like the feel of this one a little bit better. It feels more like actually regenerating models as opposed to having a weird extra save against enemy shooting or fighting. It's always a bit sinister when your opponent has actually fully destroyed models and then they're rising back from the dead to rejoin the squad and take the fight back to the enemy again. Just on the base rule, it does mean that the opponent has a decent amount of counterplay though. In theory, the idea would usually be to focus down one Necron unit at a time, hit it with all your firepower and make sure it's completely destroyed by the enemy's next command phase, and ideally don't leave something like 5 or 6 units partially injured, otherwise the Necrons are going to be regenerating a whole load of value every turn. There is a massive amount of value that can be added from various different places in the codex though that make this much stronger, and in particular a couple of things that reanimate in reaction to your opponent doing shooting or damage to your units, which is pretty brutal. We will cover all of these individually, but for example your warriors can get back d6 models or d3 plus 3 on objectives, the Canoptic Reanimator improves any reanimation within 12 inches by d3 wounds, that looks pretty spectacular as it could affect a lot of units there. The Technomancer can give you a 5 plus feel no pain type save, and also heal big individual models like vehicles, it doesn't do reanimation technically though. Resurrection orbs and units now function by giving you reanimation protocols both in your turn and your opponent's turn, so you could double dip, I and mean, that's particularly powerful with a warrior unit. The Ghost Dark and one of the stratagems can allow you to trigger reanimation protocols in your opponent's turn. That means that you at least get some reanimation before you actually cycle back to the next command phase. The Catacomb Command Barge can allow you a similar sort of thing to the Resurrection Orb, but targeted to a single unit. And even the Conversions of Dominion allows you to re-roll the dice for reanimation protocols within 6 inches, though in reality it's far too expensive. Theoretically, if you do build around big buffed up Necron warrior squads, then it can be massively hard to take them out. Potentially multiple ways of restoring models in the opponent's turn that could be buffed by a reanimator, and then regenerating yet more in both command phases as well, in a unit that you could get multiple durability buffs on. I feel like Necrons can really build tall around a few tough units of warriors if they really want to. Overall, looks pretty fun. I think it's quite nice that Necrons are going back to being sort of concerningly durable. It is quite a lot of their whole identity. 
Moving on, let's talk about the Awakened Dynasty, and their main rule is the Command Protocols. This one will be the one that might be swapped out with other detachments when they get their Codex, but it seems that the Awakened Dynasty really seems to be focused around Necron Nobles and Leaders leading formations into battle. A nice flat buff to every unit's damage output that's got a Leader on it, and then the Stratagems and even one of the Enhancements focuses around that too. The main rule for the Dynasty is Command Protocols, that means that when a Necron character is leading a unit, you get to add one to the hit roll, usually increasing your damage output from a 3 plus to a 2 plus, occasionally to a 4 plus to a 3 plus if you're fighting with warriors. In theory, that would usually be around about a 25 to 33% damage increase. Realistically, for Necrons, though, it's often not going to be quite that good due to a lot of their value being on sixes to hit with either Gauss or Tesla. It is definitely nice to have, though, particularly if your opponent's got any negative modifiers to hit on the go. In general, it means that just about every single one of these attachments will want to have at least a decent amount of leader units in them. In general, I feel like a lot of the Necron leaders bring a lot to the table just on their raw points cost and what they do. Having all that, with an extra plus one to hit, and extra bonuses with stratagems and things, is all rather good. There is an enhancement as well that we'll get onto called the Sovereign Coronal, which allows you an aura of Necrons to count as lead units. I feel like this one's going to be really popular in this dynasty, as that allows you to get the plus one to hits to a whole bunch of Necron units just for 30 points extra, never mind the extra buffs to stratagems and things. Talking of which though, let's go through the six Necron stratagems. First up for one CP, we've got the Protocol of the Eternal Guardian. This one's a one command point one to allow you to basically resurrect an infantry character the first time that they're killed. They come back at the end of the phase with half wounds remaining. In general, it's going to be pretty useful and powerful, your Overlord or your Scorpec Lord or something just gets up from the dead. If your opponents killed them in melee, it means that they have got no other opportunity to kill them that turn. They shall get a turn of uninterrupted damage dealing in until they're killed again. And overall, I think that's quite a nice and reliable way to keep a character alive and get one further turn of damage or potentially do some annoying things like having the character survive on an objective. For 1 CP, we've got the Protocol of the Undying Legions. This one I think might be one of the most important ones, and it basically allows you to activate reanimation protocols after losing a model in your squad. You get to regenerate D3 wounds normally, or D3 plus 1 if there's a leader in the unit, so basically 1 CP for 3 wounds regenerated on average. I think it's really quite powerful, particularly for a unit that might have other durability buffs on it. Basically 3 of the models that your opponent has fought hard to kill just come straight back. More if you've got a Canoptic Reanimator nearby, and you could double down on that with a Ghost Dart nearby if it's Warriors. You can also trigger it both in the shooting and the fight phase potentially. I feel like this one could be a very reliable way of getting some value out of a Necron Overlord leading a unit who can get some free stratagems. Next up we've got a melee buffing one called the Protocol of the Hungry Void. Plus one at strength and an extra AP in combat if the character's there. Overall I'd say it's a kind of okay melee boost kind of dependent on whether or not the plus one strength actually makes the difference between a wound bracket and say you go up from wounding on a five plus to wounding on a four plus. A fair bit of the time plus one strength might not actually make a difference though with the stretch toughness chart. If you're actually using it on a meaningful melee unit though and it both translates into a plus one to wound and an extra pip of AP that matters then I feel like it's really quite good value. It's just going to be a little bit situational as to what's attacking and what they're fighting. For 1 CP we've got the Protocol of the Conquering Tyrant, which again is a very strong one I think. This one's in the shooting phase, and it's just flat out re-roll the wound roll when you're shooting, only at half range unless the squad's led by a character, in which case you can have it out to maximum range. That's really quite awesome extra added value for a big shooting unit, you can't really go too far wrong with that. Maybe using it on warriors with strength 5 Gauss Reapers could be a very nice way to make them punch up a bit, or perhaps even on just a really massive firepower unit near the Sovereign Coronal, Maybe something like the Necron Monolith with its Devastating Wounds Particle Whip could be a nice choice. Next up we've got the Protocol of the Ventral Stars. This one's a return fire stratagem when your squad loses a model. Your Necron unit just gets to shoot back at the unit that shot them. And again it's better if they have a leader in them, you get to ignore cover too if they get that. Again I'd say this one's okay but maybe a little bit on the situational side. You need to have had enough of your models survive that the return fire is actually worth it. And you also need the enemy unit to be a good one for you actually to target, so ideally not firing your anti-infantry weapons against a tank or something. Could be alright maybe on something like some mass locust destroyers, or mass warriors or immortals in a fairly big unit. Might be a pretty punishing one for your opponent if they forget that this exists, and they just try and fire off a few small shots against really quite a big unit of yours. Finally we've got one command point for the protocol of the sudden storm. Ranged weapons become assault. And if the unit's been led by a Necron character unit, then you get to reroll advanced rolls this phase as well. This one says it's just triggered in the movement phase, so basically it sounds like you could do it either before or after your unit makes an advanced roll. 
means that say if he had to gamble on a high number to get either line of sight or range on a target, he could then decide whether or not the stratagem was worth it, which is kind of nice, or he could commit to it early and also get the re-roll, the advance rolls if you need to. On paper, this one usually isn't going to be the most powerful in the world. Ideally, you want to deploy your unit so it wasn't needed. In reality, though, it often is the case that you'll just need the advance move to get to an objective or to get range or line of sight, and it's worth doing that advance move. And this one CP is going to make the difference between the unit shooting or not, and that could be worth a fair few important dead enemy models. Definitely a very nice one to have, probably not one to usually plan around using, but it's certainly one that could translate into extra damage perhaps surprisingly often. Overall, I feel like these are a really strong set of stratagems. Out of the lot of them, I think my favourite ones are the reactive reanimation protocols, particularly if you've invested in a Canoptet reanimator. The protocol of the Conquering Tyrant for flat out re rolling wound rolls with shooting, potentially with something massive. And I'd say that all the rest are decently powerful, but just situational, and when you'd use them, you wouldn't want to be using them literally every turn. But when they have the most value, they're going to be really quite big. Finally, for the Awakened Dynasty, we have the Enhancement. I'd say that literally all four of these are pretty standout, really. The first one we've got is the Veil of Darkness for 20 points. This one's kind of similar and a very common competitive include, though admittedly it has got a little bit worse this time around. It's still a once per game teleport, but now it happens at the end of your opponent's turn, not just in your own movement phase. I'd say that is a little bit less powerful, and it now also has the rider you can't use it to leave engagement range with an enemy unit, as that was quite a popular use of it before to basically rescue a squad that was in combat with the enemy, and then as they hadn't technically fallen back, you could still shoot with them. I think it still is potentially powerful, it certainly means that you could have basically first turn deep strike, at least if your opponent went first I guess, or just in general could be a way of getting essentially deep strike on a unit that didn't have it, maybe slog some warriors up the board, and then vanish to reappear somewhere threatening on the midfield objectives where they had to be dealt with. I guess it would mean that you miss the command phase though, and that means that you wouldn't be able to roll reanimation protocols, which would be a downside. Overall still usable, but probably a little bit less auto-include than it was before. Otherwise, we've got the Hyper Material Ablator at 25 points. This one's a pretty massive durability increase. Stealth just for the unit in general. You always get the benefit of cover if you're greater than 12 inches away. And between the two, it's just an enormous durability increase against long-range firepower. You could even give it to something like a Technomancer for a 5 plus feel no pain on the squad as well. Necrons at the moment, I think, really want to double down on making units excessively durable so they survive to reanimate, potentially multiple times. And this looks like a pretty excellent way where you can just stack far more durability on one unit, even in addition to good Technomancer buffs. It seems very, very powerful to me. Next up is the one we mentioned earlier, the Sovereign Coronal. This one is 30 points, and it's basically an aura of Necron units counting as being led by a character. This one just says Necron units in general, so I guess it would include things like vehicles or even other characters. And for a lot of units, that would just be basically 30 points for an aura of plus one to hit for your Necrons in general. Obviously, presuming that they weren't already being led by characters, I guess. Seems really, really powerful, and having that apply to big vehicles and things seems great. Plus, basically being able to get the boosted version of all the stratagems, say for example, the V-Roll Wounds one out to full range of the shooting, that does seem pretty solid as well. Wouldn't be too surprised to see this be included in quite a few lists too. Then finally, for just 10 points, is the Semipternal Weave. This one's fairly unrestricted and looks like it can just be given to any one character model, and it gives the bearer a massive durability buff in a Feel No Pain 4+. Plus. I'm honestly kind of surprised that this one only costs 10 points. It is a genuinely impressive toughness buff. A 4 plus feel no pain means on average your opponent will have to slog through twice as many wounds as your model has, effectively double durability for the unit. I feel like character durability buffs sometimes have slightly questionable value, but I feel like for 10 points this one's pretty usable on just about any generic character that you had, particularly with access to that 1 CP stratagem to get them back up again and get more value from it. Looks awesome for something like an Overlord, a Scorpet Lord, or even a Hexmark Destroyer, but it looks like it's stand out amazing for the Transcendent Catan. Not sure if Games Workshop really intended it to be put on them, but it looks like it doesn't have the Epic Hero keyword, so basically double durability on an enormously tough model already there. Overall, I could honestly see all four of these being used. Obviously, you can only take three of them in any one army list. Kind of depends on the exact units that you're running and how you want to boost them, but I feel like you could literally build around all of them, and they're all very strong. Overall, in general, I think that the Awakened Dynasty is a pretty powerful launch detachment for the Necrons, and they have done very well. The Command Protocols is pretty nice, and a very good buff to their characters, though it doesn't help as many things, and perhaps for that reason I feel like that Sovereign Coronal will be quite worth it to get that rule on other units that don't have leaders options. There's definitely a load of strength from the stratagems and enhancements, though. I feel like Necrons have a lot of strength on these off-the-board rules, as opposed to just the things tied to their datasheets. 
Moving on, let's get on to the silvery meat of the index and talk about the Necron units. Out of their data sheets, the battle line ones are warriors and immortals, so you can spam really quite a lot of those if you want to. But perhaps for warriors, I could see maybe a few lists building around like two or three big units, perhaps. For changes to the data sheets in general, there haven't been too many that have been added or removed. The major one to have gone from the codex is the Canoptic Plasma side. That one's just been rolled into the score peg and an Ophidian Destroyer data sheets outright. To be honest, I think that probably should have been the case to start with. Otherwise, the other units still appear to be there, including things like the Standard Lord and the Locust Lord. I believe both of which had their models get range rotated, so nice that they survived. A few of the Forge World data sheets have been retired though, things like that Night Shroud Bomber and the Sentry Pylons. The Necron Forge World roster is quite a small one now, the Seraptic Heavy Constructs, a few Canoptic things and a Tesseract Arc. For common data sheet changes across the army, the Necrons have had a fair few of their weapons looked at, and their Gauss, Tesla and Particle weapons all seem to have been folded into Games Workshop's favourite damage buffs. Gauss has become lethal hits, so auto wounds on sixes to hit. That feels very appropriate given the law of gradually stripping away atoms from the foe. Tesla hasn't really changed so much in becoming sustained hits too, so two additional hits on sixes can certainly spike into a whole ton of hits if you roll well. And Particle weapons have seen a bit of an interesting change, Previously, they were just AP0 damage 1 spam weapons. They're more or less the same as that, but have also gained devastating wounds on a 6 as well. So as well as just spamming and forcing loads of saves, they'll also every so often just puncture through 1 anyway. They often seem to hit on improved values as well, often hitting on a 2+. plus. Otherwise, for different things throughout the Codex, Quantum Shielding has generally been replaced by a 4+, plus and Vulnerable save. You no longer have that rule where you only wound certain units on a 4+. plus. The leadership of the Necrons is a lot lower than a lot of people were expecting, a 7 plus for the majority of their units, and their Canoptic units are all the way down at an 8 without an easy way to increase it either, it means that a few of them might be a bit unreliable when they have the chance of being battle shocked. And again, it places further value on the leaders as well, most of those are leadership 6, so they really do help out the units that they're part of. Finally, I noticed that another trend in the Codex was a lot of units losing a bit of speed. I feel like GW might be trying to skew Necrons in a bit more of a slow and indomitable faction, rather than having a sort of similar speed to a few of the other armies out there. Really quite a lot of units lost one or two inches of movement, things like the Triarch Praetorians or the Scorpet Destroyers for example. Barring a few things, Necrons are just generally looking a bit more slow and ponderous. Let's get into the units then, and first up we have the Necron Warriors. 10 or 20 models, and either 120 or 240 points, 12 points per model basically, so a small increase compared with 9th. Their stat line is more or less quite similar, they do hit on a 4 plus now, not a 3, so that has got a bit worse there, but I feel like they're perhaps going to be a particularly tempting unit to put a character in anyway, so I feel like a lot of the time they'll be going back to a 3 plus, unless they're say a ghost arc unit. Both of their flavours of Gauss weapon got a bit of a side grade, the lethal hits definitely helps them punch up against tougher stuff, though they both lost a little bit of AP to compensate. The Flayer's AP 0 and the Reaper's AP minus 1. The Reaper also lost the Assault rule as well, which is kind of big for it, with only quite a short 12 inch range, means they will be genuinely struggling to get them in range these days. As mentioned before though, their reanimation protocols are really massive, either an extra D6 models regenerated to the squad, or D3 plus 3 models if they're on an objective. With that on the go, they do feel like the unit that's perhaps most useful for putting loads of durability and reanimation buffs on. If you were able to trigger reanimation protocols several times after the opponent shot them, even something like a depleted unit of three Necron Warriors could reanimate up to full strength if you rolled well. There are a whole ton of ways to make them tougher or reanimate more frequently. I feel like they're perhaps one of the best units to build big on. Be a bit of an anvil of the army and gum up the objectives. Hopefully kill a few things with the Gauss weapons. They probably aren't going to be the standout damage dealers of the army, maybe. Otherwise, we've got the Immortals, which really aren't that many more points than Warriors these days. They're 14 points rather than 12, either 70 points for 5 or 140 points for 10. They're also objective control too, and they more or less have the same sort of profile as last time round. They hit on 3s, a 3 plus save, though again both of their weapons did again get a little bit toned down once more. The Gauss Blaster got lethal hits and swapped that out for AP. The Tesla still has its assault rule, which is a bit unusual in 40k in general, but that's only 18 inch range now, so a bit more close. Considering they're only very slightly more expensive than the Warriors, they can do a fair bit more damage though. Their rule is called Implacable Eradication, reroll wound rolls of one just in general, or reroll all wound rolls against enemies that are sitting on objectives. That's really quite solid for mid strength guns of strength 5. I think I'd be most tempted to take the Gauss Blasters with the extra range and AP that they have at the moment. Feels like you get more value out of them against the field, as opposed to the Tesla which is a bit more niche and anti-horde. 
Otherwise, moving on to the rest of the Necron squads, Lich Guard are the third unit that it's quite easy to attach various Necron characters to. Most of them can attach to either Warriors, Immortals, or Lich Guard, and most of the other squads are locked out. Lich Guard are 5 to 10 models for either 95 points or 190. Again, they have come down really quite a lot, dropping 6 points compared with 9th edition. Again, small nerfs to their defensive and offensive profiles, but I feel like the points drop has been kinder to them. The shield no longer gives them a 2 plus save, though it still gives them a 4 plus invulnerable. The hyperphase combat is pretty much similar, but has lost a tiny bit of AP. And the war side has gained strength and devastating wounds, but only gets 2 attacks rather than 3 now. I'm still not sure that's all that impressive. I feel like overall I'd be a bit more tempted by the hyperphase swords and shields. And with the 4 plus invulnerable save, they look like they will be fairly spectacularly tanky, as if they're guarding a noble unit, then you get to have a minus 1 to the wound roll for them. Quite nice to even have things like Las Cannons wounding them on a 3 plus, or missile launchers on a 4. Overall, I think they're an interesting unit to build around at that point's cost. Definitely seem to be a good choice for some of the many flavours of buffing character. For some more armoured elites, we've got the jump infantry of the Triarch Praetorians. 5 to 10 models and they cost really quite a lot more, 135 for 5 of them or 270 for 10. I feel like in 10th edition Games Workshop has tended to charge a bit of a premium for jump infantry and how well they interact with terrain. For major changes for them, they get to deep strike now, they're a little bit slower than they were at 9 inches rather than 10, and they've got a few of the changes to the particle weapons as well. The particle casters get a big 3 shots at strength 5, AP 0, damage 1. They hit on a 2 plus and get devastating wounds, so you will be averaging at least a few of those at a unit of 5. The Rod of the Covenant is still pretty similar, with strength 5 and damage 2 attacks. Overall, I'd say that the two profiles are perhaps a bit more balanced. Their rule is Relentless Combatant, which allows them to reroll charges and also fall back and charge as well if they were engaged in combat. I guess it is quite nice they get some faster movement than, say, the Lich Guard but I feel like their stats really don't stack up quite so well against them. I'm not too convinced that these are going to be the go-to for fast movers, just seem a little bit expensive for what they do, perhaps. Next up, we've got the Hunters from Hyperspace, the Death Marks. Five or ten models for either 65 points or 130 points. These still seem to be really quite cheap, but they aren't going to be getting any of those leader-type buffs, as basically no characters can join them. Their sniper profiles for 13 points each, I think, are generally fairly scary. Strength 5, AP-2 and damage 2. Hitting on a 3 plus or 2 plus if they're stationary due to heavy. In general, I do think that that's solid enough for just a 13 point infantry model, particularly one that's at least somewhat tough with toughness 5 and a 3 plus save. They seem to be fairly effective shooters against heavy infantry and definitely a massive threat to characters as all of those shots have precision. They still have their trick where they get to intercept enemy reserves as well, turning up to the board and then getting to shoot them before the enemy gets to do anything. Might certainly make them think twice about putting them anywhere in range if they do have to turn up from out of deep strike or something. Overall, I'd say they look pretty usable, maybe not enormously general purpose and really quite skewed towards killing things like space marines, but considering they're actually cheaper than immortals and get an arguably better gun that also snipes, I feel like they're doing pretty well. Next up, we've got the flayed ones who have seen a bit of a change in 10th edition. Previously, they were deep strikers and now they infiltrate and you can only get them in smaller squads now of 5 to 10 models, rather than bigger squads of 20 that you used to be able to before. They are a bit more expensive, but for that price tag they have gained the stealth keyword, so it means they get to get minus 1 to hit at range, a little bit more survivability there, and their combat has got significantly better too. 4 attacks at strength 4 and AP minus 1, they both get sustained hits for extra hits on 6s, and also twin linked as well to re-roll the wound rolls. Putting that together and you actually have some pretty serious anti-infantry combat, even a unit of 5 of them with 20 attacks averages around about 3 dead space marine intercessors, never mind what they can do to lighter targets where the strength 4 and AP-1 can really go to work. I think having infiltrators will be very useful for Necrons, actually means that they can have a unit that sets up in the midfield. In the whole faction you've got these guys and the Canoptic Acanthrites as well who can set up forward. Their special rule is Flesh Hunger which allows you to get critical hits automatically against enemy units that are below half strength. I feel like these damage buffs are a little bit on the situational side to be honest, and aren't really the biggest thing about the unit, but when it triggers all well and good I suppose. In general I feel like they're a unit that you probably don't take too many of, maybe one or two small squads to hold down objectives in the midfield, and actually be a pretty credible anti infantry melee threat if the enemy decides to try and come and take them off you. The Cryptothrals are still here as their own independent unit, I was kind of wondering whether they might get roped in as an automatic bodyguard for the Plasmancer or not, but it seems not. You've still got the option of these guys guarding all your different flavours of Cryptex, not just them. For these guys, you get two models for 40 points total. 
And the way they work is that you have a squad that's been led by a Cryptek. These guys can also attach to that same squad as well, giving you a couple of extra little bodyguards within the unit, and really quite tough ones at that. The Cryptothrals have lost a pip of toughness, going down from toughness 5 to toughness 4, but they've still got a 3 plus save, and they've also got a 4 plus feel no pain type save now. That's genuinely really quite sturdy for 20 points, and it could be an interesting unit to tank damage on, particularly if you regenerate them with reanimation protocols. When the enemy gets close, they can chip in with a bit of damage of their own as well. The eye gives you a couple of strength 5 AP minus 1 shots, and they get a bunch more of those in combat. No massive buff when Cryptex are nearby, but they're fairly effective just on their own anyway. I guess typically they'd usually be hitting on 3s due to the command protocols anyway. As the bodyguards, they also give the guarded Cryptek a 4 plus feel no pain type save 2, which I guess could be relevant against precision weapons. And when they die, there's a 3 plus chance for them to fight on death if they haven't already fought yet. Not unhelpful, but also not the single biggest rule in the world. I feel like if perhaps you are trying to build a bit of a Necron Death Star unit with reanimation and being exceptionally hard to kill, these guys could be kind of interesting to have in the unit. Perhaps even tanking damage first and then getting restored with reanimation protocols, as they're just harder to kill than average due to that feel no pain. Next up, we've got the Tomb Blades, either in 3 models or 6 models, from either 80 or 160 points. These ones have gone up a little bit compared with 9th edition, but seeing as all their expensive upgrades are built in with their points cost and everything, they haven't really done too badly compared with maximally upgraded ones. For the most part, their stat lines are kind of similar. There's zero reason not to give them shield veins now, so they're typically going to have a 3 plus save, not a 4 plus. And then you've got the two choices to make with them, whether you either give them the nebula scopes or shadow looms, whether you want a 5 plus invulnerable save or ignores cover on their shots. And then you get the choice of guns between the particle beamer, twin gas blaster, or twin tesla carbine. I feel like they're at least somewhat balanced given the AP and strength differences. Probably the Gauss beats the Tesla a little bit, though it's a bit closer on these guys with the twin linked wounds. And the Particle Beamer certainly looks pretty interesting as well with the chance for Mortals and Blast. Otherwise for their supporting rules they remain having the minus one to hit. That's now in melee as well so they've got a little bit more durable there as well. And they've also picked up Scout at 9 inches too. That could give the Necrons a bit more of a mid-board presence. And it could even allow you to do some annoying first turn charges or movement screening shenanigans. Say if you're playing against a big vehicle army like knights perhaps, you might be able to pin them in their own deployment zone with a couple of units of these. Overall I think they look interesting enough, not going to be taken for their base damage output, but having at least some fairly durable bikers move into the midfield and then do an annoying objective or screening things doesn't look too bad for maybe a unit or two of them. For other at least fairly fast movers, we've got the Necron Wraiths next. Either 3 or 6 models at either 110 or 220 points, kind of similar to their previous points cost. I feel like they're a unit where it's really quite obvious that the Canoptech units have bad leadership. A leadership of 8 plus means that if they get depleted, they'll probably be failing Battleshock most of the time. Their combat profile's perhaps not enormously changed, but perhaps the biggest difference for them might be that they get a fair bit of ranged damage just built in for the profile now, things that were often neglected and not taken quite so much due to costing more points. Now they're going to have to weigh up the Particle Caster or the Transdimensional Beamer. Either three accurate shots with the Devastating Wounds or one inaccurate shot with Strength 4 and Damage 3. I feel like the two profiles are fairly balanced there really. I might be a bit more tempted by the Particle Casters due to a bit more accuracy overall. Their Wraith form has been changed from ghosting through objects and terrain and things to a flyby mortal wound attack. If they move through an enemy unit, then you get to roll a dice per model in this unit. Not enormous though, usually only one or two mortal wounds per a unit of three of these. Overall, I feel like they're kind of okay, but maybe not enormously outstanding. Perhaps just not playing to the best advantages of the whole formation that they've got as a unit without leaders. Finally, for some of the more standard Necron squads, we've got the Canoptic Scarab Swarms as well. These guys are now just three to six models, so you can't build big units of nine of them and they are very very cheap indeed at either 40 or 80 points. I feel like the Scarabs are an interesting sort of unit. Previously in 9th edition they would have been gumming up objectives and taking them really quite effectively. Now though their objective control zero, so that's not going to be their role. Even so though, at just 40 points for a little nuisance unit, they could be quite disruptive. For major changes, they've only got toughness too, so are a bit easier to squash. They've still got an awful lot of wounds for how much they cost though. Their combat has retained lethal hits, so auto wounding on 6s to hit, and they get more attacks now. They only hit on 5s, but given that they were hitting with fairly low strength anyway, I feel like that might actually be a slight improvement. You get more auto wounds. And then each base has got deadly demise, so it's got the chance to spam out a few mortal wounds to units nearby. And also a self-destruct option in combat as well, 
usually for D3 mortal wounds if you trigger it and sacrifice a base. If you're against vehicles, then you've got at least a reasonable chance for the big D3 plus 3 mortal wounds on a 6, as you get a plus 1 to the roll. I feel like for the most part that's probably going to be worth doing a lot of the time when you're in combat. These guys are only 13 points per base, and if you are dragging down something like a space marine each time you sacrifice one, you have come out on top. Overall, probably not a unit that you want loads of due to objective control zero. The rule that they've got to reduce enemy objective control is interesting, but I'd say not outstanding. I think they're probably best off as just very small nuisance units of just three models, and use them to screen out the enemy and take a bit more damage than they're really worth, every so often exploding one for more damage on the enemy than you've taken yourself. Next up, let's talk through the destroyer units. We'll go for the more battle line units now and talk about characters with the rest of the Necron characters later. The Locust Destroyers are one of the last surviving Necron variants with their iconic green rods. These guys can be taken in really quite flexible units between 1 and 6 models. 30 points each, but you're locked out of units of either 4 or 5 of them. So if you're going for a big unit, it will be 6 of them. The major changes for them are that they no longer can include a heavy destroyer in the unit. They're much cheaper, 10 points less than they were before, but they have also lost a bit of strength and AP on their Gauss cannons as well, though gain lethal hits in exchange. For other changes, they have gained toughness 6, so are going to be a lot more durable against certain things like heavy bolters. Reanimation protocols also works a lot better for 3 wound model units as well, so that's worked out in their favour. And on the movement front, they're a tiny bit slower, and bear in mind that fly works a lot differently for mounted units around terrain now, they're generally going to have to go around that terrain rather than straight through and over it, which might give them a few less options in terms of where they go on the board, or chances to stay hidden. Overall though, for their cost, I really don't think their damage output is too bad with that firepower. It seems like a good one as well with the big reroll wound stratagem that you might be able to get. And they can also reroll hit rolls of 1 still, though it's now only if they're targeting the closest enemy units, not just any of them. Overall, I feel like they look usable. 180 points for a 6 model unit that's got access to some decent generalist fire with some good buffing options seems okay to me. The Locust Heavy Destroyers on the other hand need to be fielded in their own unit now, not mixed in. 1-3 to three models at 45 points per model, again slightly cheaper and have gained a bit of toughness. Overall I'd say that despite the dropping cost their guns have probably been improved. They get the heavy keyword innately now and either have picked up lethal hits for the Gauss or sustained hits one for the Enmity Exterminator. And both profiles look really quite scary now. The Gauss gets strength 14 and a flat damage 6, which is kind of huge at a 45 point model. The Enmitic actually looks genuinely good anti-infantry now as well, as you're getting 12 shots out of it within 18 inch range. It's got a pretty awesome rapid fire 6 coming out of it, and that'll chew through hordes or even medium infantry really effectively. They also get reroll ones to wound against their ideal targets as well, monsters and vehicles for the Gauss or infantry for the Enmitics. And overall I think they look really quite impressive for just 45 points, even if they're not the most fantastically durable unit in the world. Certainly wouldn't be surprised to see a fair few of these being played. Next up, we've got the Combat Destroyers. The Scorpec Destroyers are again 3-6 to six models in the squad, 110 or 220 points, and they've had some similar changes to the Locust, gaining toughness 6, but losing a bit of movement, which isn't exactly ideal on a combat unit. Their melee weapons still seem pretty powerful and generalist, their hyperphase weapons have been kind of consolidated to be more like the hyperphase Thresher profile, 4 attacks at strength 7, AP 2 and damage 2, still a big threat to things like space marines, and should wound most vehicles on 5s at least. Their combat ignores modifiers, and the plasma sight gives them devastating wounds once per game. I guess that means that a lot of their most important combats will generally be getting that, as the plasma sight isn't its own unit and doesn't cost extra points anymore. Overall, I think they're looking alright. Not quite as much access to buffs and character choices compared with the previous codex, where a lot of the characters could affect them quite well. Can't help but think that they might be a little bit more niche when compared to Lichguard now. Their fairly close analog unit, but a bit faster and more lightly armoured, are the Ophidian Destroyers. These guys cost the exact same points, a toughness 5 rather than 4 now, but still have their 4 plus armour save, really quite a lot easier to kill with small arms. Their combat profile I think is a little bit on the worst side as well, 5 attacks rather than 4, but it's all at strength 4, not strength 7. They no longer get separate attacks with the blades and the claws, it's all just one consolidated blade attack. They get Deep Strike and the Tunneling Horrors special rule, which is one of those options where you get to return to reserves at the end of the opponent's turn. Handy enough for jumping around and about the board, maybe doing things like tactical objectives from the mission deck. Again, could be handy enough for this, but probably not one of the ones to build around as core damage dealers, I think. If you want the destroyers that are just going to run up and smack the foe hard, then it's still a Scorpex that you'd want for that. 
Next up, let's talk through the Necron motor pool. Talking through the Necron vehicles and Canoptech units, a lot of the Canoptech big things have been reclassified as monsters to vehicles, but it doesn't really effectively change them all that much. The Annihilation Barge is still a slightly cheaper support gun platform, it is quite a lot tougher against small arms and things now, going up to toughness 8, a 3 plus save, 9 wounds, and a big 4 plus invulnerable save. I feel like any of these slightly cheaper Necron units with the 4 plus invulnerable are going to be quite annoying to kill with high AP anti tank guns. The big Tesla Destructor has had its profile changed a bit, it's only 6 shots now rather than 10, a strength 8 and an AP 0, but gone up to damage 2. And it also gets the normal Tesla rule for the sustained hits and twin links to reroll wound rolls too. It's still going to be a weapon that's going to be stacking a lot of wounds very, very reliably on the targets. Still at AP 0 though. It's just going to be so much better against any enemies that don't have a decent armor save to start with. Fairly reliable mid-range shooting though, and it can also double down with either a Tesla cannon or a Gauss cannon. And it gets a special rule called Malevolent Arcing, with the chance to deal some scattered mortal wounds to enemies nearby its primary targets. Overall feels like it's in a bit of a similar place to last time. A fairly low investment gun platform to just stack a bunch of saves, going to be a bit more skews to killing things like elite infantry now with damage 2 rather than 1 though. The Doomsday Arc is perhaps one of the most improved Necron units I think, it has gone up to 185 points which is quite an increase, but it's probably worth it for the improvements to the main gun, particularly the fact that it can fire with its big profile on the move and isn't locked to a really weak one if it decides to relocate. The gun really is living up to its Doomsday name now, 72 inch range, D6 plus 1 shots, so a bit more reliability there, hitting on a 3 plus or 2 of its stationary, at a massive strength 15, AP 4 and damage 4. Definitely going to be massively scary against anything without an invulnerable save, against most 3 plus save vehicles you do an average of 10 wounds to it, and if you're stationary you also have the chance to get devastating wounds as well. That could make it surprisingly effective with a wound roll of a 6 as well against squads, and even more so if you've got blast for more shots. It is a bit tougher just for its platform as well, it doesn't have the transhuman quantum shielding but it has gone up to toughness 9 and the 4 plus invulnerable save again will help it out a lot, particularly with a big 14 wounds. Overall just seems generally dangerous, the opponent can't even turn off the doomsday cannon by attacking it in combat as well, it can just stay there and keep on firing. Feels like a fairly solid necron battle tank now that can both engage its contemporaries at long range and repel some infantry with those gauss flare arrays. Next up we've got the Triarch Stalker for 125 points, toughness 8 with a 4 plus invulnerable once more. I do feel like the three guns that this guy has though are all kind of unexciting in their own way. The heat ray is okay, range against both tanks and against infantry, though is kind of short range. The particle shredder doesn't really seem to be much more exciting than a lot of the other particle weapons out there, only d6 plus 6 shots and very short range once more. And the twin heavy gauss cannon gets a depressingly low amount of shots and instead gets the twin links rule. It does do a bit of damage in combat, though nothing particularly stand out. It looks like its main reason for existing is still that targeting relay, stripping cover from one enemy unit that it's shot at. I guess realistically that is useful enough, given how easy it is to get cover saves in 10th edition. Realistically it isn't all that expensive at 125 points to add that into your army. It's just maybe a bit unexciting with the amount of damage output that you get for the points off this guy though. Next up for a couple of Canoptic monsters turned into vehicles. First up we have the Canoptic Doomstalker. This one's 125 points, it's gone up to toughness 8 and it retains the 4 plus invulnerable save that it had before. In a similar sort of way to the Doomsday Arc, its main gun has been improved quite a bit. It's also got the D6 plus 1 shots and big strength of 14, this time damage 3. And it does have the heavy keyword, so it hits on a 3 plus when it's static, but doesn't get absolutely destroyed if it goes for a walk. In place of the devastating wounds that the Arc gets, this guy gets a 5 plus overwatch, which I guess is handy enough if the opponent moves some 3 wound infantry up. Might have to be weighed up a bit with firing overwatch with something truly massive though. Overall I'd say it seems okay, at least reasonably similarly efficient to the Doomsday Arc at first glance. Does maybe have some canoptic issues though, like the low leadership though. The Canoptic Reanimator, as we mentioned earlier, I'd say is decently improved. It is a bit more expensive, though kind of like last time it does do something pretty meaningful for warriors that it can boost, and it has its buff reanimation aura go out to a surprisingly large distance, a 12 inch aura of all your units reanimating and extra d3 wounds whenever they do so. I do quite like the way that it looks like that triggers on things like ghost art reanimation, or if you use that stratagem to reanimate a unit, and potentially twice as well if you've got a resurrection orb in both command phases. It means that even if this unit gets to buff the reanimation of just one squad that's clawing some models back, it could do so multiple times and get a whole ton of value then and there. 
Previously, perhaps its main issue was that it had an incredibly weak stat line at just toughness 6 and 6 wounds, meant that if it got exposed to enemy shooting, it'd go down very quickly. I still say that's maybe true to a bit of an extent, but at least it's acquired a 4 plus feel no pain type save now, so it's basically twice as durable as it really should be. I feel like this guy could be a particularly interesting choice in a list that builds heavy around a big unit or two reanimating. I'd guess probably one that most lists would only want one of and no more though. Lastly, for the big Canoptic vehicles in the Codex, there's the Canoptic Spider. These guys can't be fielded in quite as big units as they could before, it's just one or two models now, 75 points each, and once again, including all their fun upgrades. So there's basically no reason not to run them with Pascal Beamer's Gloom Prism and Fabrication Claw. You're not trading out anything for those options. On its stat line, it's gained Toughness 7, which I suppose might help out against a few things. Perhaps not the most meaningful toughness bracket in the world, but it has lost a little bit of movement, so it's only going along at a very slow and stately 5 inches now. And as with other things that are basically vehicles with a fly keyword, it won't interact with terrain quite as well. For its war gear bits, the particle beamers I think are really quite nice close range anti-most things weapons. The spider's versions of them will get 2d6 shots at strength 6, AP 0 and damage 1 with devastating wounds. I feel like the shots they've lost are probably outweighed by the devastating wounds special rule, makes them a lot more general purpose. Otherwise they give themselves a 6 plus feel no pain and they also give that to nearby vehicles as well. If you're going for a fairly mech heavy list, it seems reasonable to have one of these guys around. And also by including one, you actually give yourself a little bit of an option to play with if you play against a very psychic heavy army, say Thousand Suns or maybe Tyranids with zone rope damage. The Gloom Prism is perhaps one of the better psychic debuffing rules in 40k 10th. It gives you a big aura of Necron units getting a feel no pain 4 plus against psychic attacks. That's a serious durability boost that you could have at the centre of the battle line of your army. Could be very meaningful against certain armies that go heavy on the psychic attacks and just can't kill things half as well as they could before means that you could play them very differently against armies that go big on them. Finally, as per previously, if you've got some Scarab Swarms about, you could also regenerate them if they're depleted and near the spider. That doesn't really hurt too much, though they aren't the most valuable models in the world. I suppose they're nice to have if it's convenient though. Overall, as a general purpose unit, I feel like it's really looking okay. Lots of different utility out of it, both okay shooting and a bit of combat. Good boss for vehicles, healing Scarabs and defense against Psychic. Between all of that seems pretty reasonable for 75 points, probably better to be run in small numbers again, as with a few other things in the Necron list though. Next we've got the Necron Transport, the Ghost Dark, 125 points and a transport capacity of 10, only transporting Necron Warriors, but you can also have one Necron's Infantry character model as well. Quite nice they've actually given that a little bit of an easy on restrictions there, means that you can have Lead Warriors transporting it into battle, that's very relevant in the Awakened Dynasty. It is impressively sturdy for the points cost, 14 wounds, a toughness 9 and a 3 plus save, and a massive great big 4 plus invulnerable save. Lots of wounds chew through there, and half of enemy anti-tank shots are just going to get deflected away. It's perhaps a little bit less impressive in terms of its general purpose damage output, otherwise the gas flares have lost their AP, so even if they stack some wounds on things they might struggle to do all that much damage. And otherwise it does have that quite exciting repair special rule that we mentioned earlier, they can basically repair warriors out of turn when the warrior squad loses casualties. It triggers their reanimation protocols, so that's usually going to be D6 models repaired, or D3 plus 3 if they're within range of an objective. Seems really powerful if you use the new transport rules to basically zoom them up the board, get the warriors out onto a point in the midfield, open fire with their guns, and then you're all braced for them getting repaired when the enemy starts to take them down in return. Overall looks like a solidly usable transport, at least from first impressions. Moving on, we've got the Necron Croissant Air Force. The Doom size 225 points, a massive jump upwards of plus 60 there, and also has to contend with the new flyer rules as well. It doesn't have a hover mode, so it has to start off the game turning up on turn 2, and also that locked flight path isn't particularly helpful as well, so the opponent knows roughly where it's going to go. Its guns are fairly fearsome at least, and the death ray is improved on what it was before. It's got sustained hits D3 as well as a big D6 plus 1 damage and strength 16. It definitely will go through tanks, and the Twin Tesla Destructor is kind of similar to the Annihilation Barge one, but with only Strength 7. Its special rule is called Atavistic Instigation. I feel like this one's a bit unfortunate, as it means that you have to shoot the Death Ray as an infantry squad, which isn't always going to be the best idea. Usually I feel like it's going to be a lot more suited to taking out a vehicle or a monster if there are any there. If so though, your opponent gets to make a choice, either have the chance for a bit more devastation out of the death ray by giving a 5 plus to score the critical hits and get the sustained hits off, or they get minus 1 to hit in their next turn as they duck for cover. 
Overall doesn't seem awful, seems fairly reliable to get the Alpha Strike on an enemy tank or something when it comes in turn 2, but for 225 points I feel like it's just paying a bit too much of a premium for that, particularly when the Necrons have got quite a lot of very solid anti-tank choices, particularly things like Locust Heavy Destroyers and maybe Doomsday Arcs now. The Night Scythe also feels like it's sort of ruined by the Flyer rules. It's 145 points, so it's plus 20, and can transport one infantry unit of any size. The Tenth Flyer rules with transports though are kind of awful for it if it does decide to have a unit inside it. You turn up at the earliest on turn 2, your opponents have the chance to shoot you down, and then only after that can you move and get your unit out on turn 3. Just seems a little bit late in the game really. Its special rule is called Translocation Beams, this one's a redeploy at the end of the fight phase type thing. If there's an Ekron infantry unit within 6 inches of it at the end of the fight phase, there's nothing in the night side, and the Necrons aren't in engagement range, they can re-embark back into the transport. It does sound like on paper you can do that in the same turn as they've got out as well. Potentially having one unit disembark, shoot, and then get in again in the same turn. I sort of wonder if they might have intended it to be at the end of the opponent's turn, as that's how quite a lot of similar rules work. That does seem at least kind of powerful, basically always have an infantry unit that can just pop out, shoot, and then get back in again before the opponent gets to attack, and force them to actually have to deal with the Night Scythe. It almost feels like that might be better to use, though, with having the Night Scythe start off the board without anything in it, meet an infantry unit on the board to re-embark them, and then that way they might have actually been able to contribute to the game at least a little bit in turns 1 and 2. Seems interesting, and kind of an unusual rule to make sure that you have to actually deal with the night side before you can actually take down the things inside. Next let's talk about these Titanic Towering units with the Necron Space Pyramids. First up we've got the Monolith, this one's 385 points, so it's gone up kind of enormously compared with where it was in 9th edition, though it has had some decent improvements to go alongside that. It is one of the units that gets the big toughness 14, often seen on other super heavies. I save 2 plus and 20 wounds. Interestingly, I feel like it's going to be a bit easier to take down with things like Melter Guns, which are used to wounding it on 5s, as opposed to Las Cannons, which wound most things on 4s or 3s. It's got the Towering keyword, which I'd say is probably largely in its favour. It's kind of hard to hide anyway. And Towering in 10th edition means that enemies can't use Obscuring Terrain to hide behind line of sight for it, at least not if it can see them anyway through a window or something. Its range damage is only 24 inches, so it isn't super long range like some other super heavies, though it does have quite a lot of general purpose damage output. The particle whips 3d6 shots at strength 8, AP 1 and damage 2 with devastating wounds. Seems like a very nice one to use that b-roll or wound roll stratagem on it, and I think that most people have probably backed that up with 4 of the death rays as well. Single shots at strength 12 and damage d6 plus 1, but also sustained hits d3. The monolith special rule is the Eternity Gate. In the reinforcement step, you can select one Necron infantry unit, and whether it's either in reserves or in combat or anywhere else, you can just relocate it next to the monolith. It can potentially set up right next to other enemy units as well. It can shoot, but then can't declare a charge. Not too bad for either things that needed to get out of trouble, or anything close range that wanted to shoot the enemy from very close. It was handy enough for a bit of close range damage output and doing some movement phase manipulation, Seems maybe a bit unlikely to see entire phalanxes of these though at 385 points. The obelisk is a bit cheaper than the monolith now. It does come with around about the same sort of toughness, a little bit improved given a couple more wounds, but I'd say its damage output is far less scary. It gets 4 Tesla spheres with 6 attacks. With the sustained hits 2, they'll average a big 24 hits on the enemy with strength 7, AP 0 and damage 1. Good against hordes, but also has anti-fly 4+. To help with its theme of trying to take down enemy flying targets, it's not bad but still doesn't really help it out that much. Against say a flyer with a 3 plus save you're still only averaging 4 wounds to them which isn't great. Otherwise it also has that Gravitic Pulse rule rewritten for another edition. Pick a unit within 18 inches and they move slower, minus 2 to move advance and charge, and if they fly they get the chance to do a bit of mortal wounds to them. Definitely not unhelpful and manipulating movement is kind of nice, but it does mean that the obelisk does need to be fairly close to the front lines for that. I guess a lot of units that it can actually affect will probably be able to at least threaten the obelisk a bit, even if it is pretty tough. Overall, can't really see it getting used an enormous amount, it's just a lot more tough than it is damaging, and in general anything that's 300 points plus needs to be able to do some decent stuff to kill the enemy. Still feels like a moderately annoying unit to play against though, it'll still kill some infantry units pretty nicely, and objective control 8 will be annoying to remove from a point. 
Finally, for the big Necron Super Heavies, we've got the Tesseract Vault. This one's more expensive than either of them, being 40 points more than the Monolith. This one gets a bit of a trade-off as well, in that it's not Toughness 14, but Toughness 12, but also has a 4-plus Invulnerable save as well, which I'd say is probably the better compared with Toughness 14, at least against most things besides last cannons. For its damage output, it gets the Tesla Spheres, but without the Anti-Fly rule. Still will do lots of work against enemy light infantry there. But then it also gets its choice of one of three different fairly exciting Katan powers each turn. Either Antimatter Meteor, a strength 10 shot with d6 plus 3 shots and damage 3. That one can ignore line of sight if you need to and has devastating wounds. Cosmic Fire, which is the anti-infantry one, 3d6 shots at strength 6 and AP2, again with devastating wounds and torrent. Very nice for melting through hordes. And then, really quite interestingly, it's got Time's Arrow as well, a single anti-character shot that gets devastating wounds and anti-character 4+. plus. It's also got the Precision keyword, so basically if you hit a squad with this on a 2+, plus or a 4+, plus, the character within the squad will take a massive 6 mortal wounds. It's not always going to be super relevant, but that's a pretty high chance of just assassinating a character unit right out of a squad right there. Kind of an interesting thing for a super heavy to be able to flex to do instead of its normal damage output. Overall, it seems fun. I'd probably still rate the monolith a bit higher than it though, just more simple damage output might be better, though I must admit the Catan powers look interesting to use. For the Necron Fortification, we've got the Convergence of Dominion. This one unfortunately must be taken in three models now, and it's really quite expensive at 255 points for the trio. It does admittedly do a little bit more than it used to, which was almost nothing. The Transdimensional Abductor actually has some okay threat, 3 shots at strength 6 and damage 3, so it could be quite scary to Terminators potentially. And then the buff that it gets for units nearby is that it allows them to re-roll reanimation protocols rules to try and get bigger results if, say, you roll a 1. In reality, that isn't quite as good as it sounds, really. You're only ever going to use it when you roll a 1, and even then you're only gaining 1 extra wound reanimated when you do. Even if you're doing that the vast majority of times that you did reanimate anything, it's still not going to add up to all that much. Otherwise it does give cover like other bits of terrain, and has the fortification melee rules common to quite a few other things in 40k. Can't really see them being worth it though for 255 points, even if they are somewhat tough and have a little bit more range threat now. Before moving on to the many Necron characters, I thought we'd talk through Katarn next. These have changed quite a bit, perhaps the main thing removing the damage cap mechanic that they had in 9th edition, where you couldn't deal more than 3 wounds to them in one phase. That was a very powerful rule, but also could be far more relevant against certain armies than others. Some armies with multi-phase damage could still go through that very quickly. Now though, they're a bit cheaper in general, around about 260 to 290 points. And in compensation for the phase damage caps, each of them got a big toughness boost. Toughness 11, a 4 plus invulnerable save, 12 wounds, and they get the Necrodermis special rule reinterpreted to half the damage of each attack. That's very good toughness all around, and they're still not going to take too much damage from small arms due to most of them wounding them on sixes now. I guess lethal hit small arms when they occur, they could be a bit more of a problem. Going through the Katana individually, the Deceiver gets stealth, so he's a little bit harder to take out than most of them, a minus one to hit at range. They each get their own ranged attack, with the Deceiver getting cosmic insanity for six anti-character sniping shots, it could do around about 3 wounds to most toughness 5 or lower characters. Most of the time, unless you get very lucky though, it's not going to be sniping characters in a single attack like that. His Grand Illusion allows you to redeploy units at the start of the game. Definitely helpful, but not quite as powerful as that used to be. You don't get to find out who goes first before you do it anymore. And in combat, he gets Golden Fists. 8 attacks at Strength 8, AP 3 and Damage 3. Not quite as strong against big vehicles and tanks compared with a couple of the others, but actually more efficient against things like Terminators than most. Is actually one of the best for killing elite infantry. Overall looks interesting, they're still going to be very threatening models to put on the board. Lots of raw toughness and damage, all focused in one model. They might be a tiny bit harder to deliver to melee than they were before though. The fly and the monster keyword don't interact particularly well. So again, they're going to be going round terrain as opposed to ghosting through and over it. Next up, we've got the Catan Shard of the Nightbringer. He's a little bit cheaper than the Deceiver at 255. Broadly similar stat lines, lacks stealth, and of course he's not particularly subtle and just goes in with raw massive melee damage. The Gaze of Death is a powerful anti-tank shot. D3 shots hitting on a 2 at strength 12, AP2, and a huge damage D6 plus 3. Every one of those that goes through is going to get felt. And in combat, he strikes with the Scythe of the Nightbringer. 6 attacks at strength 14 and damage D6 like before. It does have devastating wounds, though it no longer ignores invulnerable saves. His sweep attack is very efficient against space marines though. 
14 attacks with strength 8 and damage 2. That will kill a lot of Astartes in one round of combat. Finally, just to double down on the raw damage, he also has a rule called Drain Life. At the end of both players' fight phases, you roll a d6 for each enemy unit within 6 inches. On a 4+, plus, they take d3 mortal wounds, a nice extra sting of damage, particularly if he's in the midst of the enemy army. Not really something to be relied on too much, but certainly doesn't hurt and might finish off some injured units. Overall, seems very solid. I'd probably rate him a little bit stronger than the Deceiver when comparing one for one. He isn't going to be a model that just instantly kills just about any character that is pointed at straight away, though. The Void Dragon is a tiny bit more expensive than the other two. His special things are a Voltaic Storm and a Spear of the Void Dragon to attack with at range. A flurry of strength 7 damage 2 hits and then one big anti-vehicle d6 plus 2 attack. In combat he also strikes with that spear as well. 5 attacks at strength 12, AP3 and d6 plus 2 damage with the anti-vehicle 2 plus rule to mean that he's going to be just spectacularly efficient at killing things like knights. He also gets a surprising amount of extra attacks with those canoptic tail blades as well. 6 attacks at strength 6, AP1 and damage 1, that will help out really quite a lot against hordes. Finally, he can also rip a bit of health out of an enemy vehicle within 12 inches in the shooting phase, or a 2 plus they suffer D3 mortal wounds and he gets healed by the same amount. Basically, this guy is just bad news for vehicles all around, maybe not too bad if you're expecting to see loads of knights in the meta, maybe. Finally, we've got the Transcendent Katarn. This one's 280 points, and interestingly, it's the single most expensive from the single least. He gets the same stat line as the rest of them, and his attacks are Seismic Assault with a general purpose shooting attack at range, 6 attacks at strength 8 and d3 damage, and fairly strong melee with his crackling tendrils when he gets into combat, strength 9, AP3 and damage d6. He gets to deep strike where the rest of them don't, and he also gets a special rule called Transdimensional Displacement, where if he advances, he gets to basically teleport across the board, anywhere 9 inches horizontally away from enemy models, and then presumably hit them with a seismic assault attack. Probably not something you want to do every single turn, considering that more of his damage seems to be in combat than it is at shooting, but could be kind of interesting to reach enemy objective holders late in the game, or potentially even join in with an alpha strike with a unit with the Veil of Darkness, perhaps he could have two big threats up in the enemy's face turn 1. Perhaps one of the single most interesting things about this, though, is that unlike the rest of the Katani isn't an epic hero, Looks like you could give him that 7 eternal weave, 4 plus feel no pain for just 10 points. That takes his durability from just pretty good to absolutely ridiculous. I have a feeling that they probably didn't think about that combo. But it looks like if you are running the Transcendent Katarn, you should absolutely take that. It's pretty much auto includes to get enormous value out of not very many points at all. It's pretty crazy that, say, a damage 8 hit if it went through against this guy, essentially being halved and halved again, would only average you 2 wounds on the Transcendent Katarn once the Necrodermis and the Semeternal Weave have taken effect. Into Necron characters now, and I thought we'd start with the regular nobles, headed up by Zarek the Silent King himself. He's still a big scary faction centerpiece, a bit more expensive than he was in 9th edition, 470 points, and he has to be your warlord if he's on the table. Stats wise, he is toughness 10 and has a 2 plus save, gets objective control 6 and 2 for the Meneers. Still very tanky, and he still has his 4 plus invulnerable. For his general changes, I'd say that he's maybe been skewed a little bit more towards range as opposed to melee. The Annihilator beams are still those pretty ridiculous strength 14, damage 6, though only at 24 inches. Zarek's own Scepter of Eternal Glory gets 2 attacks with strength 10, damage 3 and devastating wounds. And the Staff of Stars gives you 6 attacks at strength 6, AP 1 and damage 1. That one having an indirect fire as well, which is kind of fun. So you could maybe put a bit of hurt on enemy units hiding out of line of sight. In combat, he gets 12 attacks with a Scythe of Dusk at strength 8, AP 3, damage 2 and lethal hits. Fairly nice and generalist. Will still struggle to take down things like tanks and vehicles though. Zarek gets two main buffs, one being the ability to basically just turn off Battleshot once per turn, the other one being the Voice of the Triarch to either get boosted shooting damage, reroll charges, or ignoring modifiers to your units. Realistically, the boosted shooting damage aura seems by far the best, rerolling hit rolls and wound rolls of one at range. That's potentially really quite powerful when you could apply that to quite a lot of a Necron gun line, and it would affect Zarek himself with all of his shooting. Definitely no bad thing for those damage 6 annihilators. I guess the ignores modifiers thing could be kind of okay, perhaps depends on what you're fighting, but reroll charges is really quite a long way from the big reroll wound rolls that he had before. Overall, I feel like he maybe doesn't feel quite as essential to the faction at 470 points, and with these new rules, he's definitely still looking like an intimidating centerpiece to put down though, 
I do quite like as well the way that he's got a just fantastically devastating explosion if he dies and you roll a 6. Potentially anything up to 9 mortal wounds on enemies within 6 inches. Speaking of which, actually, just having a read, I can't see any reason that that wouldn't apply to the Triarch or Meneers as well. I might well be missing something, but if not, looks like there's at least a small chance of each of those going nuclear each time the enemy destroys one. That's probably not great news for any other Necrons nearby, if so. Moving on though, let's talk through the Necron Lords, Overlords and Nobles. We'll start with the generic picks and then talk about all the special character versions of them. The standard Overlord is 85 points. I think he looks like really quite a good deal for that. He can either lead Immortals, Lich Guard or Necron Warriors. Like the rest of them, most of them can't join some of the more exotic Necron units, things like Flayed Ones, Destroyers or Death Marks or Triarch Praetorians. Personally, he's had a little bit of a stats boost. He's gained a 2 plus save, an extra wound and the standard Overlord also gets minus 1 damage as well. Just in general, he's a little bit tankier, and similar sort of threat in combat. For loadouts, the loadouts have been consolidated a little bit. Any of his energy blade weapons have been consolidated into a single Overlord's blade. That one's strength 8, AP 3, and damage 2. And you've got either the option of taking that with a massive great big shot tachyon arrow, strength 16, AP 5, and D6 plus 2, a single shot, or swapping that out for a resurrection orb. And the Resurrection Orb build can take the other options in the Staff of Light or the Void Scythe. Resurrection Orbs do look really quite interesting for any Necron unit that's really quite big size. And you think will have the chance of surviving to reanimate. Probably seems like the better pick of the two despite the Tachyon Arrow being very fun indeed. And then the other really good thing that he does for the unit is My Will Be Done. This is now interpreted as a free stratagem per battle round for the unit. So zero CP stratagems. And he can use it even if you targeted a different unit with a stratagem that same phase. That seems like it's got a few solid options there. For Necron Warriors, you could maybe use the Reroll Wounds one, or even Overwatch with Lethal Hits Gauss weapons. On the enemy turn though, if they damage the Necron Warrior squad at all, then you could use it for some free reanimation, and use the Out of Sequence Reanimation Protocols one. Free stratagems seem kind of excellent, given that the Necron ones are pretty powerful, plus he gives the plus one to hit with the Command Protocols and a Resurrection Orb, Seems like he's very justifiable in any of those three units as well. He even makes the Lich Guard harder to kill. Otherwise, out of the Nobles, there's the Lord for 65 points. He is 20 points less, though I feel like he's probably a bit of a secondary choice to the Overlord. He costs less and has a much worse stat line. The buffs that he gives to the unit are a plus one inch to the movement, and stratagems while battle shocked for the unit that he's leading. Seems to be a bit of a budget option that you might just get for a cheap Resurrection Orb if that's all you want. And I guess with the free stratagems, you wouldn't be able to use that twice across an army. So I guess he could be another choice if you've already got the Overlord in one unit and then need another character to lead a second one. Probably a little bit on the niche side compared with some of the others though. The Royal Warden's 40 points, so he's very cheap indeed now. He can't lead the Lich Guard, but can join the Immortals or Necron Warriors. And he can chip in with a little bit of his own range damage with his Relic Gauss Blaster. Four shots within 12 inches at damage 2. His special rule is granting all weapons in the unit both the heavy and the assault keywords. Assault I think could be particularly useful for the Necron Warriors with the Gauss Reapers. That would give them a lot better of a chance to get them within that 12 inch threat range. And I guess could be handy enough with the other guns as well. The heavy keyword is probably going to be a bit redundant at least most of the time. Usually he's already given the unit a plus one to hit with command protocols. And with the cap on modifiers, it wouldn't usually stack any more than that. I guess occasionally could be relevant though, if your opponent's got stealth or something. Otherwise, he's got a once per game cancel battle shock for one Necron's unit within 12 inches. That's really quite nice to have. I feel like that definitely does add value. Basically a free insane bravery. And just in general, for the 40 points that he costs, he seems not too bad to lead a unit. If you just really want a cheap unit to give you the command protocols. And of course he does actually chip in with his own shooting. Doing solidly more damage than say two immortals would do. Overall definitely looks sufficient for a squad on a bit of a budget. 40 points seems solid for this. At least if it's giving you the plus one to hit in the Awakened Dynasty. Finally for the generic overlord type options. We've got the Catacomb Command Barge. This one's 150 points. Toughness 8. 9 wounds now at an invulnerable save of 4+. This guy also gets a built-in minus 1 to wound as well, so he's a bit tougher to take out than most. I guess that's to compensate for him losing the 9th edition type character protection, so he basically can be just directly shot now if the opponent takes aim at him. He's got solid enough shooting and combat, can fire off with the Staff of Lights and either a Gauss or Tesla cannon, or he could choose to trade out the Staff for an Overlord's Blade and Strength 8 combat. 
His buffs are to give Necrons an aura of plus one objective control nearby him. That seems kind of obnoxious for Necron warriors. Objective control three warriors seems really quite hard to remove from objectives. And it could be handy for things like Lich Guard as well with only OC one but still very tanky. He also gets a resurrection orb as well and he gets to select one friendly Necron infantry or mounted unit within six inches. And he can use that to trigger reanimation protocols in the opponent's command phase much in the same way as a standard one would do for the unit that they're leading. This one again seems very powerful, more reanimation and potentially buff more if there's a reanimator nearby. Again what looks kind of interesting is that it doesn't look like there's any obvious restriction on targeting a Necron unit with this plus a regular resurrection orb. They are different rules and the way that they're worded is different and they aren't auras as well so the core rules wouldn't prevent them from stacking like that. Doesn't seem intended though as it's sort of intended to be a resurrection orb but just not squad based and even if you weren't allowed to double stack it it'd still have a lot of value just throwing out extra reanimation to any damaged squad nearby. I guess perhaps his biggest issue is just being shot down directly though. Seems like he'd be at least a fairly tempting target with only 9 wounds, even if he does have that rather nice minus 1 to wound rule. Let's talk through the generic overlords next, and first up we've got Imitech the Stormlord. He seems like a bit of a weird choice to be honest, in that he's got an absolutely awesome buff that basically allows you to farm command points all game long. His Grand Strategist rule just allows you to gain a command point each turn that he's on the battlefield. That's really quite big, and with the Necron Stratagems that could allow for a lot of other fun tricks. Besides that though, he just doesn't really do all that much for his units by his actual standard melee and shooting stat line. He does have at least a fair bit of threat of his own, firing off with a Gauntlet of Fire Flamer plus the Staff of the Destroyer for some Strength 6 and damage to shooting. A bit of melee at Strength 6 and devastating wounds and a once per game mortal wound attack called Lord of the Storm where he has a good chance of handing out a bunch of mortal wounds to any enemies within 12 inches. It is just a bit of a weird choice though. The command point buff is pretty excellent though. I think you just have to balance both getting that and also making sure that he gets at least some use out of his damage and defensive profiles. Maybe want to keep safe for the first couple of turns and then be a bit more aggressive in the later ones. Amrakeh the Traveller is an overlord just locked to leading immortals around. He can't be taken by warriors on Lich Guard, and for the most part he's got fairly standard overlord stats. The War Scythe at strength 8 and damage 2 with the devastating wounds and the Tachyon Arrow once per game. He's got a slightly situational vehicle debuff with either minus 1 to hit or a scary chance to make them not shoot at all. Occasionally that could be massive, but the real value from him is his Lord of the Pyrian Eternals rule. He just flat out gives the unit a plus 1 to wound every time it makes an attack. Really quite a nasty damage boost, at least with the things that aren't auto wounding due to Gauss I suppose. I guess if you want to make a dangerous immortal squad he could be a pretty interesting way to do so. If he did go for the gas weapons then they'd be hitting on 2s with lethals on 6s, wounding things like standard space marines on a 2+, plus, or even wounding light tanks like rhinos on a 4+, plus, despite being toughness 9. Seems alright there, and he could also chip in with a tachyon arrow as a little bit of combat damage if the enemy got too close. Overall seems pretty fun, and maybe could be an interesting one to combo with some of the cryptex, maybe even one with a veil of darkness to get some tesla close perhaps. Nemetor Zandrek is a fairly cheap overlord at 85 points. He can lead any of the standard three, and rather than have the three stratagem, he trades that out for three random buffs, either giving his units sustained hits, lethal hits, or devastating wounds each time. Admittedly, sustained or lethal hits wouldn't be quite as good if he was leading a squad with either Tesla or Gauss. Seems pretty solid for Lich Guard in particular, though. Those buffs are always going to be useful most of the time, plus the standard plus one to hit for overlord stuff. And he also has one of those fairly valuable rules to debuff an enemy stratagem, making that if you use it a second time it needs to cost an extra CP, and that could apply to things like command rerolls or overwatch, which is quite big. He does seem pretty fun with his friend Oberon with the Lich Guard, though maybe kind of expensive for the pair of them I guess. Talking of which, Vargard Oberon is 85 points as well. Again he can join the same sort of units that Zandrek can, and also chips in with his own war tile attacks which also have precision and devastating wounds. He gives character in the units a 4 plus feel no pain if Zandrek's also in it as well, and the main thing that he does for the squad is grants them fight first. Really quite scary in 10th edition if the opponent charges you, it means that your unit will be able to be selected to activate before them, and potentially hit you really quite hard given the buffs that Zandrek could be giving you and just the sheer weight of attacks from a big unit of Lich Guard in the first place. Overall maybe a bit high investment to have the pair of them, perhaps doesn't add quite as much as some of the other characters for the cost, but they certainly seem to make for a very threatening looking unit overall. It will be a squad with a lot of advantages. 
Trazen the Infinite is 75 points, so a tiny bit cheaper. But unfortunately, despite being really quite a cool character, they haven't really given him all that much to do again. He gets the Empathic Obliterator to fight in melee. Strength 7 and sustained hits, but only AP is 0, so not all that exciting. It seems that his main actual buff is just to give his squad that sticky objectives type rule. The one where if you either move off it or fail Battleshock or something, then the objective remains yours. It's not awful, and I suppose he could go around from a point to point and get that active on a few different things. But I just don't really think it competes very well against all the other good stuff that the various different overlords can give you. He gets a fun special rule called Surrogate Host, where he basically assumes command of a different Necron Noble. He has to do that while he's still alive though now, so he can't do it when he's dead. And it basically kills your other Necron Infantry character into the process as well and swaps them out for Trazen's stat line, and he gets 4 wounds remaining. I guess in theory you could up-value a Necron Royal Warden like that, if Trazen was about to die across the battlefield, but survived in a command phase. I feel like if Trazen actually did something a little bit more interesting, then that would be more interesting in itself though. I feel like based on his stat lines and abilities, even a standard Royal Warden competes with him at least somewhat well, even if they're not quite as tough. Overall, I feel like the Necron Nobles are quite a powerful section of the Codex, Perhaps one of my favourites is just literally the standard Overlord with the free stratagems and the Resurrection Orb. I think it's quite a good value choice for 85 points. Otherwise though, a whole bunch of them seem pretty usable depending on what you want to go for. Imatech certainly seems nice for 105 points just to spawn command points all game long. The command barge seems very nice to throw out some more reanimation protocols. And the Royal Warden seems like a really efficient little cheap character at 40 points for the plus one to hit, assault weapons, and also his own firepower chipped into some immortals or warriors. Next up we've got the Destroyer characters, and there's three of them, the Scorpec and Locust Lord, plus the Hexmark. The Scorpec Lord's 115 points, so it's down a tiny bit from before. He can only lead Scorpec Destroyers, as you'd expect. It's up to Toughness 7, so fairly redoubtable against enemy light infantry, and just has a generally okay threatening melee profile. Four attacks at Strength 10, AP 3, or can swap it out for eight anti-infantry attacks. His main boost is to give his squad lethal hits, also wounding on 6s seems pretty nice for an AP2 and damage 2 weapon with mid strength, means they could punch up a bit more against tough vehicles. He also gives the squad a small mortal wound impact hit. Overall he seems okay, maybe a little bit on the expensive side for his defensive profile for the unit, though I suppose if you're not using that 4 plus feel no pain anywhere else that could make him significantly harder to take out, it does look like a very tempting unit to stand back up for one CP for that resurrection protocols. Getting him up after the enemies killed him in their fight phase could be pretty threatening. He could definitely take a big chunk out of another unit. Next up we've got the Locust Lord at 85 points, really quite cheap and effective now. He can lead either the Locust Destroyers or the Locust Heavy Destroyers, and when he does so he gives the squad critical hits on a 5+. plus. Really quite nice for just about any of the guns that he can buff. The Gauss has lethal hits and the Emetic Exterminator has sustained hits. I feel like the boost is probably going to be most relevant on the regular Gauss cannon profile that's really quite low strength. Getting extra auto wounds with that would be very nice indeed. He can also boost a big 180 point squad of those which I think is added value. With his own attacks he can either contribute his own shooting where he gets a 4 shot staff of light or add a bit of melee threat to the unit with strength 8 and damage to combat. He himself also gets a personal damage boost as well, driven by hatred, which means that he gets to re-roll hit rolls and wound rolls against half strength units. Doesn't hurt, but also feels kind of niche. Finally, he also gets either a resurrection orb to allow the units to heal in both players' command phases, that seems pretty fine to me, or a personal 5 plus feel no pain. After the two, the resurrection orb seems better, at least if he's leading a squad of locust destroyers. Overall, I feel like he does look like a pretty efficient all-round character. Put him in a big squad of Locust Destroyers for 180 points, give them critical hits and a plus one to hit with command protocols, and also get them a bit of resurrection as well, never mind the Locust Lord's actual own profile. Finally for the Destroyer characters, we've got the Hexmark Destroyer, 70 points and 6 pistols all being dual wielded at once. His rules have got the Lone Operative, so he can't be shot outside of 12 inches, and he also has Deep Strike as well, so he can turn up unbidden on the front lines. His pistol shots were maybe a bit more anti-horde focused before, and they still seem to do that okay. Hitting on a 2 with strength 6 and AP 2, but they've also picked up the precision keyword as well. Means they should be able to chip some decent damage off enemy characters should the needs arise. Otherwise, he's got two fairly powerful special rules. Overwatch for 0 CP, and he hits on a 2 plus when he does so. 
means that if the opponent move within range out of him, they should be eating at least one extra round of shooting, and that could be kind of big if they try and get close to your Necron unit with a fragile infantry unit just about to charge and hit big. It does say that you can use Overwatch in addition to another unit using the rule in the same phase. Not sure how that checks out wording-wise, as the Overwatch stratagem itself specifically says that it can't be used more than once per turn, a different requirement to the stratagem phase thing. Probably wouldn't be unhelpful to clarify that one with an FAQ. Its more powerful potential rule though is that when a friendly Necron's unit nearby is targeted, he gets to just fire again and he can shoot whatever he wants. Unlike a few similar rules, he doesn't have to return fire at that same enemy unit. He could just light up another enemy unit that gets close to that target. I could maybe see him being behind a big durable block of warriors. The enemy might be trying to get close to them to charge them, but also to whittle them down a fair bit with their own shooting as well. Just being able to open up with six pistols that are really accurate every single time the opponent shoots another unit into the warrior squad could be kind of brutal, and it might even make things not even worth shooting at the Necron warrior squad in fear of the extra damage. Overall, it looks like really quite a powerful model and pretty problematic to deal with with quite a few enemy units. Wouldn't be too surprised to see him crop up in a few competitive lists. I did see one where he was carrying the Sovereign Coronal as well, which is kind of interesting. You could have him as a lone operative bearer of that to buff other units nearby and not worry about long range shooting. Next we've got the Cryptex, four generic ones and two special characters. Most of these focus on durability boosts for their squads. The Technomancer's 60 points and he can lead the standard three Necron units, Immortals, Lich Guard and Necron Warriors. In general Cryptex are allowed to join a unit even if a Royal Warden or Noble is attached. I guess they could also take with them a squad of Cryptothrals as well if they wanted. The Technomancer gives his squad a 5 plus feel no pain, really quite a serious durability boost to most units there. Very nice on Necron Warriors versus damage 1 weapons, though a bit less meaningful against damage 2 or more. It's perhaps particularly nice on Lich Guard though, as it makes them a lot more durable against damage 2 stuff. He also heals 1 model D3 wounds at the end of your movement phase as well. I guess you need to get near to a mortal wound model to have that rule take effect, though I guess that seems nice enough on vehicles. And then he's got the option either to take a Canoptic Cloak or a Canoptic Control Node. The Cloak gives him the Fly keyword, a 10 inch move and Lone Operative. The Node gives friendly Canoptic units a plus 1 to hit within 6 inches of him. The plus 1 to hit does seem really quite nice for things like Doomstalkers nearby I guess. The Lone Operative thing does maybe feel a bit strange though, as if he was wandering around with that, I guess he would be able to be not be targeted directly and hang out next to vehicles, but then the only buffing rule that he'd be able to give them would be the healing for D3 wounds, which isn't really all that much. I guess maybe that could be interesting enough with the Sovereign Coronal as well, buff all the units with that, and also do a bit of healing as well. In general though, it looks like he's got more value in the squads where he gets the feel no pain type thing too, plus can potentially do the other stuff as well, should he want to. Overall looks very good value for just 60 points though, you could give him that hyper material ablator as well to make the squad even tougher. Next up we've got the Psychomancer for 50 points, he's the melee manipulation one and strikes with a single strength 6 and damage 3 attack with that abyssal lance, gives a minus 1 leadership aura and hands out a battleshock test in your shooting phase to one unit within 18 inches. Battleshock is definitely important, but at that point of handing it out, the only real thing that you're going to be doing is stopping stratagems happening in the fighting and the shooting phase. Then the enemy goes back to normal in their command phase, that's if they even fail it in the first place. With the unreliability of that, an enemy unit healing Battleshock so quickly just doesn't really seem worth it, not compared with the much more predictable buffs that the other Cryptex get. For 50 points, we've got the Chronomancer. He gets to attack with the Aeon Stave, so D6 shots and blast. He doesn't get the option for the single anti-tank shot anymore. And he gets two really quite nice buffs. A minus one to hit for the unit that is leading. It's even better than stealth because it applies in melee as well as at range. Quite a nice defensive boost, and I guess that's competing with the Technomancer's one. The other thing he does though is kind of cool as well. A move shoot move rule for his squad, and they get to move five inches after shooting. It does stop them from charging, but even so it's really quite a cool rule. Just allows you to reposition your unit a bit more, potentially gets them moving at double time towards an objective pretty much, or could do some move shoot move shenanigans and get them back into cover or even out of line of sight after firing. That seems pretty usable with some immortals maybe. Overall, like the Technomancer, I feel like he's kind of fantastic value for just 50 points. Makes a big ranked up squad a lot tougher, and getting an extra movement phase is really quite big provided you didn't want to charge. The Plasmancer I think has got a bit more interesting in 10th edition as well, he's 55 points, and instead of boosting durability, he boosts damage, 
It gives the squad critical hits on a 5+, plus. pretty nice both for Gauss and Tesla weapons. It's not an enormous percentage damage increase, but it perhaps seems quite good for making Gauss a bit more relevant against really tough targets that they really need the lethal hits against. And he both does get it for quite cheap and also chips in with his own damage output as well. The Plasmic Lance with 3 shots at Strength 7 and Damage 2, and also firing off Living Lightning as well. A bit of an anti-horde mortal wound attack where you attack one enemy unit, roll 1d6 for each model in that unit, and for each 6 they suffer a mortal wound. Against elite infantry squads that's not going to do too much, but if you manage to target a 20 model horde with that, that should be 3 or 4 mortal wounds there. Kind of nice to see that he's a bit more useful than he was before. It's just a lot easier to justify taking him for the damage output if it's also helping out the squad and making them more dangerous as well. A bit more of a synergy piece than just a guy who does what he does. Then for a bit more than the other crypt text, we've got Orican the Diviner. He's 80 points and his trick is to give the unit a 4 plus invulnerable save. That's particularly nice for the lower save Necron warriors who only have a 4 plus armour anyway. Making that into an invulnerable is really quite massive. It would be a bit less relevant if you've got cover or if your opponent's hitting you with lots of AP0 stuff, but against anything that's AP1 or AP-2, this might well be doing a fair bit more than some of the other crypt techs do. Could be kind of interesting for the Lich Guard as well, who could then afford to take the War Scythes if they wanted to, and then also get a 4 plus invulnerable save, even though they're passing up the shield. oricon has got a pretty fun once per game combat move as well, with the stars being right. Previously this triggered and it made him into an empowered mode of his stat line. Now it's just a once per game boost that you can trigger it for the right moment, probably whenever he gets into combat I guess. His staff of tomorrow gets his attacks and strength characteristics tripled, so usually that's going to be 6 attacks hitting on a 3, strength 12, AP 3 and damage D3. And on top of that every single wound counts as a critical wound, so anything that he wounds with becomes mortal. Usually that's going to be a phase of basically 6 mortal wounds of damage output, or at least against the vast majority of targets. A pretty massive thing to have in the middle of a Lich Guard unit, or even say Warriors or Immortals. A bit of a nasty lurking threat that could take down as much of his points cost and potentially a single round of combat. He should get that against things like Space Marine Terminators at least. Overall he looks very interesting, a lot more so than he was before, though he might be more tempted by some of the cheaper Cryptex. Finally for the choice of Cryptex we've got Illuminal Seraz as well. He's 220 points and works a bit differently to the rest now. A massive points tag and doesn't join any individual unit, but instead operates as a lone operative provided he's nearby other friendly Necrons. Alongside his very high points cost, they have given him some really fun special rules as well. His mechanical augmentation now goes off as an aura, and it affects the Necron battle line units within 6 inches of him. I guess in theory it would be good to have at the heart of a phalanx with a bunch of warriors or immortals in it. Each time his augmented warriors make an attack, you improve the AP of that attack by minus 1, and each time the enemy makes an attack against them, he also worse than the AP by one. That's a couple of seriously massive boosts there, even if they are only locked to certain units in the army. I feel like it seems particularly impressive for Necron Immortals, maybe. Making their Gauss weapons into AP-2 seems nice for firing away at 24 inch range. And making enemy AP worse against them is very good with a save of 3+. plus. They might even be able to get the benefit of cover as well with that hyper material up later from another crypt tech. It's really quite a powerful rule, and his own personal stat line is fairly threatening as well. 3 strength 9 and damage 3 shots with the Eldritch Lance. A similar sort of combat stat line, and it's also perhaps surprisingly tanky as well. Toughness 8, 9 wounds, a 2 plus save, and a 4 plus feel no pain, with a 4 plus invulnerable. It's kind of similarly hard to take down as Rebute Gilliman, besides the resurrection thing, and that's kind of surprisingly good for a Necron Cryptek, even if quite a big and expensive one. Finally, if he does manage to kill anything in combat, then he gets to augment his manipulator ability for an extra plus 3 inch range. I guess that could potentially give you a little bit more freedom with where the warriors move around him, but feels like an additional nice to have extra rather than something to plan around. Overall, I feel like it's really quite an interesting unit. Definitely the buffs that he gives seem like they're very powerful and could be applied to an entire formation. His personal stat line is surprisingly tanky and does have some general purpose damage, but at the same time he is 220 points and that's a massive amount compared with what else you could get in terms of HQ choices. Overall I feel like the crypt techs seem to be very good value for how much they cost. I think probably my favourite are all the durability ones really. Oricon, the Technomancer and the Chronomancer all seem like they could have good arguments for using them in the right unit. And besides that the Plasmancer and Saraz seem interesting as well. Finally for the Necron units though we've also got their exotic Forge World choices. A fair bit of Canoptic goodness, plus a Tesseract arc. 
First up, they've got two flavours of Tomb Centipede, basically. The Tomb Stalk is 130 points, and these things get Toughness 9, a 3 plus save, a 4 plus invulnerable, and 9 wounds. At least fairly tanky for that points cost once more. This Tomb Stalker gets to Deep Strike, and for its combat attacks, it gets a bunch of Gauss Slicers, a Strength 5, AP-1, and Lethal Hits, and then some Anti-Medium Infantry Combat with Strength 6 and Damage 2. I feel like just overall though, its profile doesn't really add up to being particularly exciting. It is a bit niche in terms of what it really wants to engage, and does seem to be skewed a bit more in terms of durability compared with damage. It does get a free Heroic Intervention Stratagem though, if that's ever relevant. And these constructs can be another option for getting that Gloom Prism into battle as well, which you can get for a bit cheaper on the Canoptic Spider. Again, that could be some good situation or psychic defense if that's very relevant in the matchup that you're in. The Tomb Sentinel is the other similar Canoptic construct. This one instead, though, mounts a big Exile Cannon with D6 plus 1 shots, Strength 10, and Damage 2. Again, though, hitting on force without buffs is just not really all that exciting. It's far weaker than, say, a Doomstalker, for example. His special rule is that he's good against units on objectives, and he's tougher when he's on an objective himself. Getting a bit of AP and debuffing enemy AP if he's on an objective. Still, though, I feel like it doesn't really outweigh his overall stat line. Just seems to compare badly to a Doomstalker, never mind anything else. Perhaps a more interesting unit, though, is these Canoptic Acanthorites. Kind of like Forge World Necron Canoptic Wasps, you get 3 or 6 of them in the squad as either 85 points or 170. I think they're interesting for two reasons really. First up, they are infiltrators, so they can forward deploy like the flayed ones. Really quite fun considering that they move quite fast as well. And they may be a tiny bit harder to take out for at least light infantry with toughness 5 and a 3 plus save. They are only 2 wounds though. The damage output I don't think is particularly exciting. A single melt shot per model hitting on a 4 plus plus a bit of strength 5 and AP-2 combat. They do get a fun rule called damaging enemy armour, where if you have the Necron unit shoot one of the units that was hit by one of these guys, and if you get any critical wounds, usually 6s to wound, then that would mean that you get to improve the AP of the attack by 1. It's not absolutely enormous, and it wouldn't be relevant for Gauss shots, but if you do have a whole load of volume firing the army with a bunch of Tesla Traps, and of course any of the Gauss hits that don't get lethal hits, it does seem that that could be a way to allow a few more of your small armors to punch up against things with tough armor. Overall, I feel like their main value though is probably in being infiltrators with a different sort of sting in the tail. Not unusable for maybe one or two small units to hold down the midfield versus flayed ones perhaps. Next up, for slightly bigger stuff, we've got the Tesseract Arc. 130 points, and again a fairly similar defensive profile to the first two Tomb Sentinels and Tomb Stalkers. This one mounts two secondary weapons, either Gauss or Tesla cannons, and then also one primary gun, a Tesseract Singularity Chamber, which you can either use as a Strength 6 and Damage 2 Flamer with D6 plus 3 shots, or a Seismic Lash Mode with D3 shots at Strength 9, AP3, and a big damage D6 plus 1. It does look like it's fairly general purpose, not too bad threat for the points to be honest. I feel like it might compete at least okay against things like the Annihilation Barge with the two secondary weapons. And even if the chamber thing it isn't the most big damage output in the world, at least you've got the choice of two different shots. Still probably doesn't feel super standout though. Finally and last but not least, we've got the Seraptic Heavy Construct. The biggest and most points intensive single model in the book, besides perhaps Sarek the Silent King. The very big Canoptic Construct gets a toughness of 12, a 3 plus armor save with a 5 plus invulnerable, 24 wounds and a great big objective control of 10. Feels at least somewhat similar to Questorus Pattern Knights perhaps, and has fairly powerful threat both at combat and at range. When shooting it's got the option of either choosing to take the transdimensional projectors and the synaptic obliterators or two singularity generators. The first two give you some enormous anti-tank shots with d6 plus 4 damage, 4 of those total, plus 8 shots at strength 5 and damage 2. Or you can trade them all out for essentially 46 shots at strength 10, AP 3 and damage 4. Really quite general purpose, they might struggle to deal with the heaviest armour. Overall seem at least fairly balanced from first glance. You'd be able to be either better against elite infantry, or a little bit better against heavy armour and light stuff. In combat it strikes with its titanic forelimbs, 6 attacks hitting on a 3 plus at strength 14, AP 3 and a big damage 5 or sweep attack with 12 attacks at strength 8 and damage 2. Otherwise it can hand out a little bit of battle shock and has one of those titanic walker rules for moving over other things, plus the potential for a very big deadly demise explosion with d6 plus 2 mortal wounds. Overall looks interesting enough, 
You could get him hitting one or two plus quite easily with that Sovereign Coronal if you wanted. Looks like a Canoptic Control node wouldn't work on him though, as he doesn't have the Canoptic keyword. I guess it could be a particularly interesting one to use that full reroll wound stratagem on as well. That looks absolutely brutal on those singularity generators. Rerolling wound rolls on strength 10 should make them a better threat against just about anything in the game. Overall looks fairly playable to me. Decent amounts of big shooting and damage, and at least fairly tough. So with the Forge World units looked at, I feel that just about brings us to the end of our Index Necrons review. Really quite a lot of exciting stuff for the faction in my opinion. Overall, reanimation protocol seems solid given the amount of buffs that you can get, lots of scope for multiple activations of reanimation there. The stratagems and particularly the enhancements have a lot of really powerful and usable ones I think, though I guess by its nature the Awakened Dynasty is going to be a bit more hyper focused than most on characters leading units. After the data sheets, I feel like the ones that can get characters in as a result are looking pretty nice. Warriors, Lich Guard and Immortals all look interesting, plus maybe the Locust Destroyers with a Locust Lord attached. Otherwise, maybe some Tomb Blades and Flayed Ones to hold the midfield in small numbers. Locust Heavy Destroyers and Doomsday Arcs look like they're pretty efficient firepower as it goes. Spiders and Reanimators look pretty nice for a bit of support with durability of the Central Army. And I do quite like a lot of the Necron support characters just on their own merit. The Necron Overlord seems very nice, as do a few of the named variations and some of the cheaper Cryptex with a nice durability boost. It's going to be interesting to see what Necron players put together with these units. Let me know your experiences so far in 10th edition down in the comments below. Look forward to hearing any insights from the Vanguard of the Silver Tide. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.